Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. Now, once again, it's time to keep our weekly appointment with that incomparable host and storyteller, Dr. Watson. I'm sure he's expecting us. Of course I am, Mr. Bell. So come in, draw up your usual chair, and make yourself comfortable. <sighs> ah, that's it. Thank you, Dr. Watson. What story are you planning to tell us tonight? Quite an exciting one, I think. Uh, the only relic I have of it is this rather mildewed piece of paper. I came across it just before you arrived as I was going over my notes on the case. But this doesn't look very exciting. It's a hotel bill, and all it says is board and lodging for one week, 28 shillings and sixpence. <laughs> then there's an extra item, one pint of ale not paid for, five pence. And yet that extra pint of ale was ordered at the very moment when Sherlock Holmes and I entered into one of the weirdest experiences we ever had. I call it The Adventure of the Sally Martin. Before you begin the story, Dr. Watson, do you mind if I... Uh... Have a word with our listeners? <laughs> <laughs> of course not, Mr. Bell. Now, Dr. Watson, how about The Adventure of the Sally Martin? Well, the story began many years ago in the tiny fishing village of Kingsgate on the Kentish coast. At my insistence, Sherlock Holmes had agreed to take a much-needed holiday. And we were staying for a few days at a small seaside inn known as the Silver Dolphin. The adventure began, I remember, on a foggy, bitterly cold evening. Holmes and I, after a hearty dinner, were seated in the public bar of the inn talking to a garrulous old sailor. Little did we think that even in that peaceful village, dark tragedy was stalking us. Tragedy that very soon was to be brought to our attention. Here you are, Albert. Another pint. Thank you, Condy, sir. Ah, yes, you're very good health, gentlemen. Oh, an amazing capacity. That's the fifth. I can't think where he puts it. I see no mystery there, Watson. Go on with your story, Albert. You just reached the point where the shark had turned on you. Ah. Well, gentlemen, I ups on the rail and dives into that raging sea. Pulls out me knife. Oh, really? Uh, where did you get the knife? I thought you said that you'd lost your clothes in the hurricane. Step to me middle, I was. But I always kept a barry knife stuck in me belt. Oh, really? How uncomfortable. Well, I see the white belly of the shark turning at me. I let him have it. A rip here. A slash there. Ooh, there was blood all over the place. Never saw such a mess. Uh, Storytelling's very dry work, gentlemen. I'll order you another pint, Albert. Thank you kindly, sir. Watson. Look who's just come in. Oh, it's our old friend Sergeant Dobson, isn't it? Yes, and judging by his expression, the local representative of the law has serious business on his mind. Good evening, Sergeant. Good evening, Mr. Holmes. Evening, Dr. Watson. How are you, Dobson? <laughs> can I have a word with you, Private Lake? Of course you can. Oh, I beg pardon, sir, but uh, you did say something about buying me another <laughs> pint. <laughs> Don't worry, Albert. We'll have it sent over for you. <laughs> Please give Albert another pint, Annie. Put it on my bill. Right you are, Mr. Holmes. Perhaps you wouldn't mind stepping into the private bar, gentlemen. Very well. Now, Sergeant, sit down and tell us what's on your mind. Murder, Mr. Holmes. Great Scott. Who? Where? Well, have you gentlemen noticed the fancy sailing boat that's been moored out in the cove this past week? Yes. I was informed that it was owned by George Byron, the Lancashire cotton manufacturer. Uh, that's correct, sir. The boat's named the Sally Martin. And right at this moment, Mr. Byron's lying there in his cabin with a knife in his ribs. Deader than a boiled mackerel. Oh, gracious me. I rode ashore to send a telegram to the police at Canterbury. But I left a constable to guard the people aboard. Good. I, I'm going back now to conduct my investigation. But the Canterbury police can't be here for morning and I... I was hoping that... That we'd help you, Sergeant? Well, sir, a case like this is a little outside of my experience. Well, just a minute, Dobson. Mr. Holmes is still a sick man. It's cold out and foggy. As his doctor, I forbid... Rubbish. Oh, How can I stay here in the inn while a murder lies waiting to be solved less than a mile away? Come, Watson. The game's afoot. Oh, how much further is it, Sergeant? About a, about a quarter of a mile, well, sir. If we don't get there soon, I won't answer for the consequences. I'm a rotten sailor. Cheer up, Watson. In the meanwhile, Sergeant, suppose you give me as many facts as possible. How many people are aboard the Sally Martin? Well, there's three passengers, Mr. Holmes, and, and two in the crew. Well, let's have those passengers first. Well, there's there's Mrs. Byron, the dead man's wife. A lot younger than him she is, and, 
And she looks a bit on the flighty side, if you ask me. Even though she was having a proper fit of hysterics, like. And then there's... There's Clarence Byron, the dead man's brother. And what opinion did you form as to his character? Well, sir, you understand I didn't talk to him much. But he acted cool as a cucumber, just... Just as if murder didn't mean a thing to him. And the third passenger? Well, he's a young fella by the name of Hodgson. Secretary to the dead man. Very nicely spoken gentleman he is. But it seemed to me as if Mrs. Byron had quite an eye for him, even, even through her tears. That's why I said she seemed flighty-like. You're very observant, Sergeant. Oh, it's, it's just training, sir. How about the two crew members? Well, there's, there's Captain Small. He seemed perfectly above board. And a, a man by the name of Coggins. Arthur Coggins. He's a, he's a deckhand. And a mighty surly one at that. He gave me quite a bit of back chat when I questioned him. How much, how much further is it? Barely a hundred yards, old chap. Oh, I feel awful. Do hurry up. Move over, Sergeant. Let me take an oar. There's the murdered man, Mr. Holmes. That's just how we found him. Very illuminating. Look at that murderous knife. It's buried to the hilt in his chest. Yes, but more interesting than the knife at the moment is the tableau presented in this cabin. What story does it tell you, Watson? Very simple story. Somebody opened the cabin door, came in, and stabbed him. Oh, come now. Surely our years together have made you a little more perceptive than that. I don't see what you're driving at. Well, for one thing... In his right hand is an open book. Oh, been reading? Yes, and the sergeant has told us that the oil lantern beside his bunk was still burning when the body was found. Oh, that's right, Mr. Holmes. There's no sign of a struggle. The bedclothes are in, aren't even rumpled. No cry for help was heard. So let us reconstruct the scene. Mr. Byron was lying in his bunk, reading, as you observed, Watson. Oh, quite easy. The door opens. The murderer comes in, the knife hidden in his or her clothing. The victim has no suspicion of his fate because the murderer was someone who could enter his cabin at will. And suddenly... The fatal blow is struck. Then it must have been one of the three passengers. I think we may reasonably include the captain. The master of a schooner surely would have the ability to enter his employer's cabin without creating suspicion. Oh, you're right, Mr. Holmes. I think we've seen enough here, Sergeant. Where are the passengers? In their cabin, sir. I told them to wait there until they were sent for. The main saloon's empty. You could see them in there nice and private-like. Splendid. Then let's go there at once. <laughs> My friend's only trying to help you. Oh, how can he help me? He can't bring poor George back to life again, can he? No, madam. But at least I can try to find his murderer for you. He's right, ma'am. So take it easy, like, and answer his questions. Very well. Uh, what do you want to know, Mr. Holmes? Can you suggest anyone who might have had the motive for murdering your husband? Oh, half a dozen men. George made a lot of money. He was a hard businessman. He had many enemies. But none of his business enemies had an opportunity of killing him tonight. His biggest enemy, though I never could make him believe it, is on this very boat now. His brother Clarence. Biggest enemy? His own brother? Oh, come, come, it's come, true. madam. It's true. Clarence sponged on him. That's done for years. And ever since I married George, he's tried to be more friendly to me than a brother-in-law should be. Mm -hmm. Just because I was once in the theatre, he seems to think I didn't know how a lady Oh, you, you were in the theatre? I wonder if you knew a girl who was dailies. Pretty little figure. And they Watson, the... surely this is no time for your theatrical reminiscences. Oh, sorry, Holmes. Mrs. Byron, are you familiar with the terms of your husband's will? Everything he has comes to me. Oh? Well, that's perfectly natural, isn't it? Perfectly. But in that case, your brother-in-law would hardly seem to profit from your husband's death. I don't know what you're suggesting, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. You think I stabbed him? I wouldn't have had the strength. Mrs. Byron, I suggested nothing. But I'm interested to notice that you answer your questions as well as ask them. Well, I'm not staying here to answer any more questions, Mr. Holmes. I'm going back to my cabin. If you want me, that's where you'll find me. No, wait a minute, ma'am. Let her go, Sergeant. And please ask Mr. Hodgson, the secretary, to come in here. Just as you say, sir. Well, upon the soul, she's a fine little thing, isn't she? <laughs> that's attractive, too. What do you make of her, Holmes? It's hard to say. If one wished to adduce motive, it would be easy. Well, she must be 25 years younger than her husband. And uh, a fortune coming to her at his death, eh? Precisely. And despite her own statement, a woman would have the strength to stab an unsuspecting man to death. Here's Mr. Hodgson, sir. Thank you, Sergeant. Please sit down, Mr. Hodgson. Yes, Mr. Holmes. This is a shocking business. It is indeed, my boy. 
I'd like to ask you a few questions. Any questions you like. When did you last see your employer tonight? Mm, shortly after dinner, Mr. Holmes. He was taking a turn round the deck. We chatted for a few minutes, and then I went to my cabin and retired. It was about 9.30 or quarter to ten. You heard no cry for help? No shout in the night? No, none. The first I knew of the tragedy was when the captain awakened me. Can you suggest who might have had a motive for his murder? Mr. Holmes, that's... that's a little hard to answer. Come now, Mr. Hodgson. Don't hold anything back. You'll have to talk in a court of law, you know. Yes, I suppose so. Well, gentlemen, in my capacity as secretary, I did know that my employer's brother, Clarence, has been borrowing heavily. Only yesterday morning, I was compelled to draw my employer's attention to an irregularity in the monthly bank statement. A 500-pound check had been drawn. The signature was a forgery. And you think that Clarence Barron committed that forgery? Yes, I do, sir. And so did my employer. The two brothers had a terrible row about it. Uh, Sergeant, will you be good enough to ask Mr. Clarence Byron to come here, please? Right you are, Mr. O. One very personal question, Mr. Hodgson. Was the relationship between you and your employer's wife a purely social one? As a matter of fact, Mrs. Byron has been very kind to me. Oh, really? My family are dead and she's taken an interest in me. But I give you my word that it's been purely platonic. Mr. Holmes. Yes, Sergeant Hobson. Mr. Clarence Byron's lying in his bunk, sir. He says he can't come here. He's got a heart attack. A heart attack? That's rather convenient, eh, Holmes? Yes, Watson. And it's also convenient that there's a doctor aboard. Let's go and see him, shall we? Any better, Mr. Byron? Yes. Yes, I do, Doctor. That injection you gave me helped. It was digitalis, I suppose. No, it wasn't. Holmes' heart's perfectly sound. He was simulating an attack. So I gathered, since an injection of plain water apparently gave him immediate relief. Plain water? Yes, your heartbeat was full and regular, and your color normal. So I decided to try an experiment. And a very successful one. Why did you pretend to have a heart attack, Mr. Byron? I, I wasn't pretending. I do have a bad heart. That I don't doubt. Only a bad heart could prompt you to swindle your brother and then murder him. I didn't murder him. Though, uh, I can tell you who did. Oh? You are very eager to shift suspicion, Mr. Byron. Who, in your opinion, murdered your brother? It's that deckhand, Arthur Coggins. Only a few days ago he threatened my brother's life. You heard him make the threat? Yes, I did. It was his second day aboard. It was early in the morning, and I was strolling on deck when I came on this man Coggins, who was standing by the mainmast, practicing throwing a knife. You're pretty handy with a knife, Coggins. What's that? I said you're pretty handy with a knife. Yes, I know how to use a knife. Do you uh, think you're going to like being on this ship? No. Not if I don't get treated like a human being. Just yesterday, the owner yells out to me, Yeah, you, whatever your name is, treating me like dirt. Whatever your name is. Can't he find out my name? I'm as good as he is. One of these dark nights, he'll get what's coming to him. That's what he said, Mr. Holmes. And he looked as if he meant business. He's an expert with a knife, you say. Holmes, do you think it's possible that Coggins threw the knife through a porthole into the dead man's cabin? Yes, Watson, it's possible. Your story was interesting, Mr. Byron, though, of course, entirely uncorroborated. I think we'll go and talk to the captain and see if he can supplement your information. Mr. Holmes, I, I can't answer for the passengers. That's no business of mine. I appreciate that, Captain Small. But you'll answer for your crew, no doubt. That I will, sir. And this man Coggins is a no good if ever I saw one. Insubordinate, surly, always talking about how he's as good and better than those who employ him. And why did you engage him, Captain? I didn't, sir. That was arranged by my employer, Mr. George Barron. If I had my way, Coggins would have gone back ashore the first day he stepped aboard. Where are his... Great Scott, is that a revolver shot? Well, it sounded like it, and it came from the forecastle. Mr. Holmes! Mr. Holmes! This way, Sergeant. Good heavens! Why, it's Coggins! With a smoking revolver in his right hand. He's committed suicide. Yes. Very convincing, isn't it? His head is sprawled on a piece of foolscap. 
A confession note, no doubt. Yes, it is. Look at this. I killed him, and with my record, I knew you'd catch me, so I took the quick way out. Case is solved, Holmes. On the contrary, Watson, it's becoming more involved. If you look closely, you'll realize that we now have two murders to solve instead of one. And somewhere on this boat, a murderer is still at large and may strike a third time. Dr. Watson, the apparent suicide turned out to be another of the murderer's victims. Yes, Mr. Bell. Holmes at once sent Sergeant Dobson to check the passengers while the three of us stood in that tiny cabin, an oil lamp swinging above us and shedding a strange glow on the macabre scene. I asked him why he was so positive that it wasn't suicide. He will notice, Watson, that the revolver is in Coggins' right hand. Yes, Holmes, I don't see what... Then the... ignore the right hand and observe the left. A deckhand is accustomed to hard manual labor. Notice the calluses on his left hand and the freedom from them on the right. By Jove, he was left-handed. Yes, he, he was, Mr. Holmes. I, I, I've noticed him at work. Again, you'll observe the shot entered his head from behind the right ear. A remarkable feat of dexterity for a left-handed man. And the murderer had the note ready, shot Coggins from behind, but made the mistake of placing the revolver in the wrong hand. Precisely. But this note, obviously in disguised writing, poses another problem. What does the phrase, and with my record, I knew you'd catch me, mean? He must have had a police record. But why volunteer the information? I wonder if the murderer had a reason. Captain, you said that Cockins was engaged by Mr. George Byron. Well, sir, he told me about the new man, but I don't know that he interviewed him personally. Where was he engaged? At the Seaman's Hostel uh, here in the village. Oh, what are you getting at home? Surely it's obvious, Watson. If this man Coggins had a police record, his murderer might have deliberately placed him on this boat knowing he would be suspected. Yes, yes, it's possible. But the question is, who engaged him? Well, Sergeant? All three of them in their cabins, Mr. Holmes, and swore they hadn't left them. And yet we know that one of them must have slipped down here and shot Coggins? Lock them in their cabin, Sergeant. Keep good watch on them. Dr. Watson and I are going ashore. Ashore? Why, Holmes, when the murderer's here on this boat? Because I'm convinced that the clue to his identity lies waiting for us at the Seaman's Hostel. Where is the place, Sergeant? And who runs it? Old Ma Jenkins. It's the house just next to the Red Lion on the quayside. Splendid. Watson, we're taking this note and rowing ashore. Another trip in that filthy rowing boat? Must we, Holmes? It's a fine time of night to rootle a respectable woman out of a warm bed, I must say, and no mistake. But, Mrs. Jenkins, Call you me Ma. Everyone calls me Ma. Very well. We've come to you because you're the one person who can help solve two murders that took place on the Sally Martin tonight. Murder? Come into me parlor. I'll light the lamp. There. Now, what's this you say happened aboard of the Sally Martin? The owner, Mr. Barlin, was stabbed to death about ten o'clock tonight. Later on, a seaman by the name of Arthur Coggins was killed, too. Arthur was killed? You knew this man, Arthur Coggins? Of course I did. Over a year he's been staying with me. He couldn't get a ship because of his record. What record was that? He brought his ship's papers to me. They all do when they're out of a berth. The last ship he was on two years ago, it was. He got mixed up in a knife fight. Oh, did he? Alaska was killed and Arthur arrested. They couldn't prove he was guilty, but he hasn't had a birth since because it was written in his paper. Well, that fits into your theory, Holmes. The murderer engaged him deliberately, knowing his record. Exactly. Mrs. Uh, Ma. That's me. Do you recall the name of the man who interviewed Coggins? No. The man who engaged him for the Sally Martin? Uh-uh. No. But, but it's here in my book. It's the last entry I made. Uh, here it is. Clarence Byron. The brother. There's our man, Holmes. Could you describe the appearance of Mr. Byron, Ma? No, I, I can't say I remember much about it. He was all muffled up. He was a nice-spoken gentleman, though. You can recall no clue to his identity? It's uh, worth a sovereign to you, if you can. A sovereign? Well, let me think out. Y yes, there's one thing I do remember. He had a gold signet ring on his right hand. Splendid, Ma. Watson, the case is solved. Of course it is. 
Clarence is the man. May I congratulate you on your powers of observation, Watson? Ma, here are two sovereigns for you. Two? But you The said... extra one is for the privilege uh, of borrowing this uh, registry book of yours for a few uh, hours. No. I'm taking it back to the Sally Martin with us so that we may compare the handwriting in it with that of a murderer. <laughs> But this is ridiculous, Mr. Holmes. Why should you ask Clarence to sign his name? Bear with me a few moments longer, Mrs. Byron, and you'll see why. I'm blessed if I know what you're up to, Mr. Holmes. I a little patience, Sergeant, and you'll see, too. Have you any objection to signing your name, Mr. Byron? I uh, suppose not, though I'm just as confused as the rest of them. There. Thank you. And now, Mr. Hodgson, I wonder if you'd mind helping us. Of course not, Mr. Holmes. What can I do? You saw a forged check. I wonder if you'd try and imitate the signature that Mr. Clarence Byron has just written. Mr. Byron's signature? Yes, his writing is extremely individual, but I think you could help prove that under certain circumstances it can be elastic. See how nearly you can imitate it. I think it'll help us to prove that he murdered his brother. Clarence, you did murder George. I knew it. Mabel, you're out of your mind. Will you copy his signature, Mr. Hodgson? Of course, if you think it'll help you. Holmes, Holmes, look, look. Hodgson. Sign, please, Mr. Hodgson. Clarence Byron. There. Thank you. That's a remarkably fine gold signet ring you're wearing, Mr. Hodgson. Thank you. Watson, give me Mar Jenkins' register book. There you are, Holmes. Sergeant, I want you to compare the signature in this book with that which Mr. Hodgson has just given us. I think you'll agree that they're both written by the same man. They are. Well, blow me down. So he forged Clarence's signature. Exactly. He is quite a specialist in handwriting. Albert, you didn't kill him. You couldn't have done it. It's no good, Mabel, and you know it as well as I do. You knew what I was up to. You helped me. <gasps> you suggested that I use Clarence's name. That's a lie. It's a lie or not, way. Sergeant, I suggest you take out your notebook. They're talking in front of witnesses, so make the most of the fact. <laughs> The sun's coming up, Watson. Oh, yes, and the, the sea's calmer, Hingham. A very satisfactory start to a new day. The confessed murderer and his accomplice, both of them safely in the care of the police. Yes, I was convinced, until we found him murdered, that Coggins, the, the deckhand, was the guilty body. Exactly what you were meant to think. I thought that, uh, as he was an expert knife thrower, he could have thrown one through a porthole into the dead man's cabin. No, Watson. Both portholes were at the head of the bunk. But the knife wound was from the underside of the heart and upwards. It would have been impossible to have thrown the knife through a porthole at such an yes, angle. Yes, yes, I can see it all now. Young Hodgson, coveting his employer's wife, planned a knife murder and then engaged Coggins, knowing that with his record, he'd be the logical suspect. Yes, but like so many murderers, he tried to be too clever. He left enough clues to hang himself half a dozen well, times why over. Why did Clarence pretend to have that heart attack? The nervousness of a person who knows himself to be under suspicion... A futile attempt to escape interrogation. Well, I'm glad it's all over. I'm exhausted and I'm frozen. And I'm delighted to think that this is my last trip in this horrible rowing boat. Whereas I'm feeling very stimulated. And in a distinctly altruistic mood. Altruistic? What do you mean, Holmes? If you'll observe the flurry of excitement at the quayside, the figures in blue surge that are at this moment embarking in boats, you'll realize that the police from Canterbury have just arrived. Well, I still don't see how altruism comes into the picture. I intend to claim no credit in the solution of this crime. And in consequence, I see little reason why our old friend Sergeant Dobson should not very soon be known as Inspector Dobson. Now, Dr. Watson, what about next week? Well, now, let me see. Next week. Next week, I think I'll tell you how Holmes solved a murder with only one clue. The depth to which the parsley had sunk in the butter on a hot summer's day. I call this bizarre adventure the strange death of Mrs. Abernethy. <laughs> Tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Rygate Puzzle. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of California Pictures, Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion Pictures. This is Joseph Bell speaking for Kreml Hair Tonic and Kreml Shampoo, 
and inviting you to be with us next week at this same time when Dr. Watson will tell us about the strange death of Mrs. Abernethy. <laughs> This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.